Okay, without further ado, let's get started. Um, again, welcome and uh, thank you so much everyone for, for joining this session. Uh, I know that there are uh, many uh, different places um, and things that you can be doing uh, today, uh, but you chose to, to come together here um, this morning or this afternoon. Uh, and uh, for, um, on behalf of uh, the American Medical uh, Society of Sports Medicine, uh, Dr. Burton uh, and myself, uh, Bianca Edison, um, we're really excited um, for this panel. This is our first inaugural uh, diversity healthcare professionals uh, sports medicine panel. Uh, and uh, for us, we wanted to take the opportunity um, for young folks, our, our younger rising generation to come learn uh, from uh, some real spectacular uh, leaders in this field and to really hear about their stories, their experiences, um, and kind of uh, their kind of tidbits of, of knowledge and wisdom um, and um, bits of encouragement to help you uh, kind of gather uh, information um, if you're interested in this field, uh, if you're wavering, and also um, create some connections for you as you move forward. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping rules. Um, the panelists to allow you to see them um, as they're speaking, we just ask that right now uh, you uh, keep your video off um, as well as mute yourselves, please. Um, if uh, you have any questions at all that you want to have answered, um, please send them and submit them in the chat. And we'll, uh, while we might not be able to uh, address all of them, um, we'll try to get to as many as we can in the Q&A session. During that Q&A session, you are more than welcome um, to turn on your video um, as well. So again, welcome. Um, and I will, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Burton, um, who will start us off with introductions. Thank you everyone for joining us. And like Bianca said, I know there's lots of things you could be doing on your Saturday weekend. And we re really appreciate you taking this time for uh, to share with us. And um, we hope that we can provide you with some information and uh, some discussion so that you can learn more about what the sports medicine fields are and ask some questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and introduce some people here. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and do a, a brief introduction of our panelists, and then our panelists are going to share some experiences and lots of other things that they do may come up. They're a really amazing group of panelists who've done all kinds of wonderful things. And so these are just a couple things about them. So this is both uh, Bianca and me. Uh, Bianca is a physician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She's an assistant clinical professor and at, for USC and obviously one of our moderators today. And then I, am, I work at Seattle Children's in uh, Seattle, Washington and medical director of our sports medicine program and clinical professor at the University of Washington. I also chair USA Track and Field Sports Medicine and Science Committee. So our first panelist is Sean Johnson, Dr. Sean Johnson. He is a physical therapist. He did his schooling at a uh, university. I'm, I'm, my screen is in the way, so I'm moving things around. <laughs> at University of Sioux Falls, and has a doctorate in physical therapy from USC, and then also did an additional uh, orthopedic resident, uh, residency at USC, is board certified orthopedic clinical specialist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and currently is doing work with uh, the Los Angeles organization, the Angels, uh, has worked with USC in various other capacities. And then also a founder of the USC Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy Black Alumni Association and treasurer and board directors of the Southern California National Association of Black Physical Therapists. Our next panelist, let's see here, is Dr. Amy Atmore. She did her education at Oregon State University, her undergrad. She also has a doctorate in physical therapy with USC. 
She's a private physical therapist and does very cool things that she'll probably share more details about. She's director of performance in Seattle, Washington, and is working within the NFL and has previously worked with the NBA Phoenix Suns and then did a lot of other cool work in brain rehabilitation centers and orthopedic clinics in high schools. Our next panelist is a sports dietitian, um, Alicia Glass. She got her bachelor's degree at Case Western and her master's in public health nutrition at Case Western as well. She's a super cool job at the universe, it's university, United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Uh, she provides nutritional support and services for our Olympic athletes, in particular USA swimming and USA track and field. And I feel honored that I get to experience traveling and working with her. She's a really amazing person an asset to our athletes. And, okay, Bianca, I'm gonna let you introduce Angel, our next panelist. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Um, Angel Brutus uh, is a sports psychologist uh, who I had the um, great pleasure of listening to one of her um, podcast episodes on the Madam Athlete podcast. So thank you, Dr. Brutus, for all your amazing words of wisdom. And um, it, it was really exciting to hear. Uh, but she is um, she has a doctorate in psychology uh, with a concentration in sports um, performance um, at the University of the Rockies. And um, she um, works with a lot of athletes um, to help them um, with that mental emotional side of performance uh, and um, making sure that um, you're not just strong physically, but also strong uh, mentally because the whole person is very much important. Um, she's also the co-chair for the Association of Applied Sports Psychology Nominations Leadership and Development Committee. Okay, and she has a very cool job that she's going to be joining the USOPC as well at Chula Vista as um, sports psychologist there. Our next uh, panelist is Dr. Erin Hassler. She is an athletic trainer did her bachelor's at Clark, and she has a master's in sports health science from Life University, and then has a doctorate of athletic training from A.T. Still University. She has her own practice called Sports Factory, and she does all kinds of cool things, coverage everywhere. I think you'll find her lots of different places and a very strong advocate for athletic training, in particular for um, people of color, and has done a lot of work in organizing uh, people and gathering people. she I know her from USA Track and Field and the work that she's done as far as medical coverage there amongst many of her other um, work. Great, Bianca Alejandra. Dr. Merriman uh, is a athletic trainer um, as well. She um, received her uh, master's in rehabilitation sciences at uh, Cal U Pennsylvania and her doctorate uh, of athletic training at Still University. She uh, works as um, really the, the director and, uh, and athletic trainer and a career technical uh, education train, uh, teacher at um, Dorsey High School, which is here in Los Angeles. Um, and she also co-founded the Latinx Athletic Trainers Association. Uh, what's really fantastic is uh, Dr. Mary is very committed uh, to trying to help make sure that our health care field for sports medicine is representative of the athletes that we see. Uh, she also leads a lot of uh, diversity health professional panels uh, for young students. So thank you, Dr. Merriman, for joining us today. All right. Next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Naomi Stennett, who uh, is a sports medicine fellow currently. Uh, she um, it received her um, uh, residency training at University of Miami at uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital um, and is now doing her fellowship in sports medicine at University of North Carolina at uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, she uh, is a um, cycler aficionado um, as well as a volleyball athlete um, and represented Jamaica in uh, international tournaments, the Pan Am Games, um, a lot of world qualifiers. And then she'll um, next, her next path, she'll be um, beginning a position at um, University of North Carolina um, with their sports medicine department and campus health. 
Dr. Krishna White uh, is joining us here today as well, uh, another sports medicine fellow. Um, he uh, had um, received his master's in health education and human behavior uh, with a graduate minor in exercise physiology, uh, went to medical school at Ross University uh, and, um, as, and uh, residency at University of Florida and is currently doing his first medicine fellowship at Orlando Health. Uh, what's very interesting, Dr. White is also um, a high elite athlete. He has his second degree black belt in Shotokan. Hey, our next panelist is Dr. Brandi Waite. She did her undergraduate education at Stanford University and medical school at UC San Francisco. She did a physical medicine and rehabilitation residency at Stanford University and then a sports medicine fellowship at John Hopkins University. She also has a subspecialty certification in sports medicine and lifestyle medicine. She is the director of sports medicine at UC Davis Health and a professor at, uh, at UC Davis uh, Sc School of Medicine. She has been a team physician uh, for USA Track and Field in the past, the NBA, WNBA, and Sacramento Ballet. She also has been a team physician for Sacramento Republic FC professional soccer team and the UC Davis Collegiate Athletes. She also has done some cool work with uh, met, being a medical director for marathons and ultra marathons also, which are kind of a fascinating event and has a pretty cool uh, lifestyle and preventative medicine programs for both students and, and her patients. Dr. Randon Hall uh, is um, another one of our distinguished panelists. He's a sports medicine physician. Uh, he uh, did his medical school at Vanderbilt uh, University, um, did his res pediatric residency training at Monroe um, Carroll Junior Children's Hospital, um, also received a master's in business administration at Bellevue University, uh, and his sports medicine fellowship training at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He currently works at Phoenix Children's Pediatric and Adolescent Sports Medicine Program at Phoenix Children's Hospital and provides a lot of sideline coverage, um, taking care of our youth athletes um, for local high schools, especially during the football season. Okay, and our final panelist is Dr. Brandon Mines, who did his his undergrad degree at Morehouse College Medical School at University of Wisconsin, a family practice residency at St. Luke's Medical Center, and we were co-fellows together, did our fellowship together at UCLA. Uh, he is a team physician for the WNBA Atlanta Dream, NBA Atlanta Hawks, and the NFL Atlanta Falcons. And he's also medical director for Clark Atlanta University. We had the opportunity to do our training together. So um, it's fun to be able to share in this experience. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we're gonna just get into these questions. Um, and again, for the panelists, um, feel free to um, jump in and, and address um, questions that speak to you. So the first question um, for any of you is, what drew you to the field of sports medicine and why, why do you do what you do? I might just go ahead and pick on somebody. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've got to pick on my um, my co-fellow. So, Brandon, Dr. Mines. So, okay. Hey, everybody. Um, great to be here. So, first part was what drew me to sports medicine. Um, I think for me, the one of the main thing was since I was really interested in kind of a holistic approach to the, the person, right? Like taking care of kids and the parents and older people. Um, I like the idea of trying to be involved with the whole family and, you know, get people interested in exercise. And also I like the idea of people who were exercising, who had a problem, like they injured themselves or they, you know, couldn't quite get to their goals because of maybe an injury or something like that, that I could help them um, with their motivation to improve and, and get back to their sports. So I like the idea of kind of being someone I could, could help them kind of get to that point. Um, I do what I do really now um, 
you know, every day it's, it's, it's something different that there's always someone who's, you know, they exercise is an important part of their life. I mean, we know with COVID and the pandemic, there's a lot of, you know, mental um, uh, health issues going on and, and exercise is really important. And a lot of people, for example, have problems, you know, injuring themselves or I've been trying to run and this hurts and that hurts. And so really trying to be an advocate for them to get better, you know, figure out avenues that they haven't thought of to, to get back to healthy lifestyle. Um, that, that, that kind of pops into my mind for the short term since we're you know, in the middle of uh, the pandemic, but in general, it's just really, I really enjoy helping people get better who really want to get better and, are, and need some help. So. I can, can piggyback on that, that. question. Oh. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. I was looking for a raise hand option and that wasn't there. Sorry, Brandy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all right. I'll, I'll just really quickly say that, you know, you can, I, when I was going through school, I, I really kind of, I liked science and I liked sports. And so a job in sports medicine was a great way to combine my love of science and my love of sports. Um, so if you kind of like science and, and you like sports or you like to be active, you, whether you like watching sports or participating in sports, um, from any standpoint, it's great that we have so many people like I'm a physician, so I'm a, a, um, a medical doctor and I take care of the medical needs of, of people and I, I love doing injections and I love teaching people how to do the right exercises to help keep them healthy. And um, so those, those things really kind of drew me to, to sports medicine and everybody, if you're going to work, you have to have a job. It's going to be 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week or whatever it is. And so you might as well try and pick a job that you really enjoy a lot of parts of it. And I really enjoyed science. I really enjoyed sports. And so I think that's why sports medicine, all the different careers in sports medicine are so, are so fun. And I'll pass it off to Dr. Brutus. Angel, please. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll make it really quick. I think the first thing that came to mind to me as I was listening to Brandon speak, and even I was, I'm glad that Brandy went first too, because um, oftentimes when, when I get inquiries about the work that we do, oftentimes people will settle for because I like sport and because I like, you know, helping people. But working in sport is not sexy at all. It's a grind and I'm a grinder. So uh, that's what brought me into sports medicine, so to speak. And that's what keeps me there just because it really speaks to the personality that I have in terms of never being satisfied. Um, it's a culture that is never satisfied. Um, and so, you know, for us, you know, leading a department, one of our philosophies, you know, is that, you know, the mental health is physical health. They are not separate. The mind and body are so intricately, you know, connected that it's important to address both aspects of it. The other part of the philosophy that we adopt quite often is that just because our department might have the title of counseling and sports psychology or, you know, moving forward with mental health services um, with the USLPC, every single part of the system is responsible for the well-being of the athletes that we serve. Um, so just because we have the title doesn't mean that we own the experience. And so, you know, it's really interesting to be a part of an integrated care team of a number of different professionals within the sport ecosystem to all have this one common goal in mind, and that's to make sure that we take care of the well-being of the athletes that we're serving. And at the same time, provide them opportunities to empower themselves to make sure that they're on the track to um, continue improvement because this athlete lifestyle is a, a lifestyle, you know, once an athlete, always an athlete. Uh, once they retire, there's still that lifestyle aspect that's there. And so we're in right positions to be able to not only address the immediate needs, but then also help to, to remember that these are things that are going to transcend their sport life long after they're done with it. Can I go? I, I don't want to uh, beat up a dead horse, I guess. Um, hi, everyone. Dr. Krishna White. Um, if you ask a lot of athletes or a lot of uh, physicians, I'm a physician, by the way, uh, I ventured into uh, sports medicine because I grew up always wanting to be a family doctor. Uh, I came from Jamaica. I was born there, came here when I was six years old in Orlando, Florida. And uh, I came from a, 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 a humble beginnings, best way to put it. And around my area, um, I seen that there was a need for a medical presence disparity wise. Uh, so I came in with basically going to free clinics. My family physician uh, at that point in time was someone that I looked up to and admired. So I wanted to be just like him. I played a lot of sports growing up. I did karate, but I also played basketball, did football, did track and field. So I continued to be injured 
<laughs> and all the injuries basically piled on themselves. And I just was like, you know, I, I don't want to be injured anymore. <laughs> so I had to figure out a way how to not be injured. And, and once again, the physicians that I worked with, uh, well, physicians that I seen when I was growing up really made an impact on me. I had surgeries. I had sp uh, sports physicians that see me after the surgeries and even orthopedic surgeons that did my surgeries uh, spoke to me and they kind of geared me to a, a, a lifestyle that I wanted to see myself in. Uh, so I, I kind of modeled my image after them. and wanted to pursue sports medicine because of those injuries and because I know how it feels to be an injured athlete and not knowing what the next step is. So that that's my uh, take on it. Um, if I can share my perspective, I am an athletic trainer and going off of what uh, Krishna just spoke on, I played sports my whole life. Um, and I actually wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I'm in a room full of physicians. But when I got myself injured playing soccer, I had a part time athletic trainer who was a Latina. And she's the one who actually helped me and introduced me to athletic training and she helped rehabilitate my injury in high school at her athletic training clinic where I met more athletic trainers of color. And I didn't know what athletic training was at that point. I, I just never heard of it, um, but I knew I loved broken bones. I knew I loved the gory stuff. Um, and so like my idea in high school was I wanna put bones back together. I wanna be in a surgical room helping athletes get back to where they want. But then I found out about athletic training and I was like, you, you get to tell me that I can do this and still work with an orthopedic surgeon and still be on the sidelines watching sports. I'm like, I'm all for it. Um, so Myra, who is the Latina athletic trainer who I met, she kind of inspired me one, because she looked like me too. I didn't know that that existed and she introduced that world to me. Um, and she also helped to guide me with that clinic. Uh, and my first job was an athletic training intern at that clinic. So that clinic ended up being my home and my story is kind of why I do what I do now, because I'm currently a high school athletic trainer and a high school teacher. And I want that for my kids, for my students that I didn't have a full-time athletic trainer, but I am their full athletic trainer. I am most of the time their first, first exposure to healthcare, as we all know, with health dis uh, disparities and insurance issues and whatnot, our wonderful youth it usually doesn't go see a doctor unless it's really really bad. And so I am oftentimes the first healthcare professional that they meet, especially as freshmen, um, and exposure to sports medicine field. And so any chance I get to be that person that Myra was to me, to my students and to my community, I absolutely take that chance. Thank you so much. This is, um, you guys have all wonderful, um, kind of tidbits and experiences. It sounds like, um, a lot of things that drove many of you to what you are doing today have been some uh, mentors and, and people that exposed you to the field. Um, so if any of you want to kind of expound on that, um, what mentors have really made an impression upon you um, and also for our students, um, how can you go about finding a mentor in your field? What, do you, what have you found that has worked um, or not work for that matter. I can go ahead and start off. Um, Dr. Stennett, Naima Stennett, I am also from Jamaica and I played volleyball for Jamaica. And um, as has been echoed in this group, I had a lot of injury and we have a very low access to sports medicine in Jamaica. And so when I was playing volleyball for Jamaica in the world championship, one of the male um, volleyball players for Jamaica, he was actually an orthopedic surgeon and he drained my teammates knee in between games in the hotel room. And I thought, wow. And that was kind of my first mentor because it, it, it was just an amazing thing to see. Like he could pro pro provide that service right there and then. And I was very naive and very green as they would say to sports medicine. And so it started there and it started with a conversation. And oftentimes you cannot be what you cannot see. And thank God I had a teammate who wanted to do be orthopedic surgery in Jamaica. But by having those conversations and sharing what your passion, what your career path, you'd like to see your career path to be, that is, in my opinion, one of the first steps is by having those conversations. Because the more you have those conversations with folks, 
the more they're able to direct you. Oftentimes, mentors don't always look like you. I am a Black, Jamaican, female volleyball player, and I've had mentors who are male or for a different race, um, from a different country. I've had the, I think it's a luxury, to be honest, of having the experience of playing college volleyball in the United States and playing professional, um, semi-professional volleyball with Jamaica, because it's two different experiences. And I think having that opportunity, it has given me um, various views to, uh, viewpoints to look at. Um, and so things like these, I'm so proud of AIMS SM and I'm so proud of this group to put this on for our students because this, it starts with things like these, you know, being able to do, have that door cracked open so you can see what is available to you. I hope I answered at least one of those questions. Yeah, I love what Dr. Stina had to say there. It was It was kind of resonated with me. I thought it was excellent. And I think that no one can achieve anything in life without mentorship. You know, um, you know, we look at our professional athletes that we work at and they all have, have had mentors in their profession and in their craft. We look at someone like a Kobe Bryant who spoke highly of how he sought after mentorship from Michael Jordan, right? And I think the key is, is he sought it out. And so I think that what people need to understand is that networking is a skill and that networking then can lead to mentorship. Right. And so just like Dr. Stena just said, this is a window to connecting with a potential mentor. Um, all the time I have individuals, young people who reach out to me on LinkedIn, who, who find my information on online and, or, or, or email me or, or et cetera, social media. So I think one is having the courage to be able to be able to put yourself out there, reach out to someone who that, that either is, resonates with you in terms of what they do professionally or someone that is, is someone that you look into and that you can aspire to potentially be and have the courage then to connect with that person. Right. And then to be able to do that in a professional way. Right. So being able to uh, initiate the conversation in a very professional way, but then doing it in a way in which you can then use that individual to learn from, to grow with and to develop a relationship with. A lot of my mentors are people that I connected with while in both undergrad and graduate school and are people that I've chosen to stay in touch with. So the other part of that is, is once you find someone that you connect with, continue to stay in touch with the individual, even as you then matriculate through in your journey and in your career and you stay in touch with that person so that person can continue to guide you with each goal that you achieve, with each new chapter um, that you open up into. So I think that the biggest thing is, is look at mentorship through uh, this this environment of networking and that that's a skill and being able to put yourself out there and connect with the right people. And I, say I just so wanted to jump in. Uh, oh, go ahead. go ahead. I just wanted to jump in from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, you know, uh, I'm a sport dietitian and when I got into the field about 15, 20 years ago, sport dietitians were few and far between. Um, maybe universities had a, a dietitian that was assigned to their football team, but they weren't assigned to any other team or, or their, their number one responsibility was football and maybe they filled in the gaps when they had time. Um, and I reached out to a lot of the dietitians that were mainstream and a lot of the, the people that were known as sport dietitians, and I didn't get any responses. And um, I pushed forward and I think actually the preceptors that I had and the people that were overseeing some of the programs that I was in, they were telling me, that sounds like a cool job, but you should probably pursue something else and then keep that as a hobby. And I think that fueled me even more. Um, I wanted to find it and I wanted to do it. And um, I eventually found my people. Um, sport dietitians are all over the place now. Um, we have a lot of them at the Olympic Committee. They're um, hired within a lot of the uh, you know, uh, NGBs or national governing bodies here in the U.S. And so it has definitely grown. But I think um, for me, it was the people telling me that that job didn't exist. And so you should pursue something else that fueled me to do it because I knew that was an area of interest for myself. Um, every athlete has to fuel. They have to choose foods. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. And um, I felt there was a huge niche. And so um, I guess I, my message is to encourage anyone who, who sees a need in a specific area, 
um, to figure out how can you do that job and how can you do it well. Um, and I think sport dietitians, what sets dietitians apart from nutritionists is that they're evidence-based and um, we truly acknowledge the ex expertise, um, you know, in all the different fields, especially all the different um, positions represented on this call. So um, yeah, go out and get it, especially if you can't find it. Oh, good job, Alicia. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Aaron Hassler. I am an athletic trainer. Uh, I worked with Dr. with Alicia Glass and Dr. Burton um, with USA Track and Field. And I've had an opportunity to see, again, what she's saying. Everyone has their own their own niche. They have their their own thing that they bring to the table. One of the things that um, I wanted to say about mentorship was that as much as you, the student or the mentee are seeking information and seeking knowledge and seeking wisdom, you too should be bringing something to the table. So it's not just a take-take relationship, it's also what can I bring to this person? How can I um, contribute to the relationship? so that it's not just one-sided. Um, I found that um, I've been a, a mentor and a mentee. And the, the best relationships that I've had in those situations have been the ones that are um, mutually beneficial. They're symbiotic. They're not just taking relationships. So um, to the students, as you all are going through your um, education process, look for ways to um, just enhance what you bring to the table. I guess that's that's my biggest takeaway. It's just, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's not just networking to get, to get someone's contacts, to get someone's uh, reference letter. It's also you contributing. You may be able to um, help them with a program or um, help promote whatever it is that they're doing, even contribute in literature. Sometimes mentors will bring along a mentee and have them uh, support some of their writings. So that's all I got. Thank you. I would, I would add one, uh, one other thing real quick. I think uh, one of the important things about mentors is one, we all have had them. So we all know how important they are. I think a lot of times people are scared to reach out or ask and you could tell why uh, you know everybody's here on a Saturday. I love when somebody messaged me random out of the blue, hey, can you help me with this? I get excited by that because one, that shows the passion that that person has and that's somebody I really wanna help. Um, I think the other thing too is you don't necessarily have to find a mentor that's doing exactly what you wanna do. You know, my advice is always find a mentor that you like and respect how they do what they do. So a lot of times, you may not have someone that's exactly for the sports um, sport dietitian example. You might not have someone that's doing exactly what you want to do, but you love how they do their job and how people respect them and how people uh, how that person handles their business and being able to say, okay, I guarantee you that person's going to know somebody will be able to help you get to that next connection just by how thorough they do things. And I think um, that can also help kind of keep keep things a little bit broader. Thanks, you guys. I think that we all have certainly experienced that um, there's somebody in our pathway that has helped us. And I think that can be a little bit scary to ask at first. So I think what you're hearing from all the panelists here is that we've had mentors who've helped us to get to where we are. And we also want to help other people to get to where they want to be. So even though it may feel a little bit out of your comfort zone to speak up and ask somebody, we are here and we want to help you. And that's why we're all here today. So feel free to you know, take that step into your uncomfort zone and ask people a little bit more about what they're doing. And I, I bet you'll find somebody who's really interested in working with you. Um, I wanted to ask the panelists, I think that we've all had certain obstacles that have come our way in our pathways into our careers. And I'm wondering for you guys, what kind of challenges have you encountered? How did you overcome then? Or, or even if you would, I don't know if, like, if you have a memorable failure that, that happened that you had to overcome to get to where you are, we'd love to hear more about that. 
I have a really good failure story. Um, if I can share it, I, um, it was when I was applying to my sports medicine fellowship. So you do your, if you're going this route through medical school, you do your medical school, then you do your residency training. You could do a residency like I did in physical medicine and rehabilitation, which is kind of a combination of neuro rehab and orthopedic training. You could do family medicine, you could do pediatrics, you could do emergency medicine. So there are lots of different fields of medicine you can get your primary specialty in. And then you apply <clears throat> usually during your final year of your residency training to a fellowship program. And um, I was, I'm a Stanford gal through and through. I did my undergrad and residency at Stanford. I really wanted to stay there to do my fellowship. And I applied to the fellowship at Stanford and they had never had someone from my background in physical medicine and rehabilitation do their sports medicine fellowship. They had had a pediatrician, they had family medicine doctors, but they hadn't had someone in my background. And so um, the year that I applied, um, my mentor who was there was the second in command of the fellowship. So I was like, okay, I've impressed him. He's my mentor. Like he said, I'm really certain, you know, you're are one of our top candidates. And then when it came time for the fellowship to be awarded, the person who was just senior to my mentor called me and said, you know, we're not going to, you, you didn't get the fellowship and actually we're not going to have a fellowship this year. And I said, oh, well, why is that? Did you run out of funding or did something happen? And he said to me on the phone, he said, well, I just really didn't feel like we had any applicants that were to the quality that I would want our fellow to be. And I was like, expletive expletive in my mind like I'm thinking what the heck is this guy saying so not only was it a setback but he also was basically telling me that I wasn't good enough that my application and my presentation to him was not acceptable and I then called my mentor and said what what the heck and he said oh I felt I couldn't even I let you go early from work today because I couldn't even look you in the eye because I felt so horrible I don't know what this this person superseded me. This is not what I wanted, but he's in charge. And I had banked on, you know, being able to stay there and do that fellowship. And yet I, I had interviewed for other fellowships because you never put all your eggs in one basket. And I had been offered another not, uh, fellowship at Johns Hopkins, which is no, you know, horrible place to be. And I had turned it down, but I turned it down saying, I, you know, telling them my reasons for wanting to stay at Stanford and how I really um, liked their program, but I just couldn't do it. And and literally the next day after I was not given this fellowship at Stanford, the director from Johns Hopkins emailed me and said, has Stanford made their decision yet? Because I haven't offered this fellowship to anyone else. And I'd still like to see if it can go to you. And I thought, you know what? Serendipity rules. Like it was just, you know, you never know where you're supposed to be. And in my fellowship at Johns Hopkins, I, I you know, I said California girl, but I got my experience on the East Coast. I networked with a lot of different people. I made way more additional connections because I already had connections at Stanford. I was able to go and make more connections in a new area. That's where I got connected with doing ultramarathons. And ultramarathon is a big race that's, you know, more than a marathon. And this company that I started working with during my fellowship has paid for me to go to every continent on the country, yes, including Antarctica. They pay my way and I've traveled all around the world with these groups of people getting to see really remote and beautiful parts of the world that I would never have seen otherwise. And that was all because of my connection at Johns Hopkins because this jerk at Stanford had the nerve to tell me that he didn't think that I was good enough to even be their fellow when now actually I've done more of those things. I was the first black woman to be a full professor in my field of medicine. I've done a lot of things. And so don't let someone who underestimates you and causes a failure that's outside of your control to derail your career because the best revenge is a life well lived. And that's what I have continued to do. So just take that and add fuel to your fire. I mean, you have your little moment where you rock and cry in the corner and then you come out and like take, take over and continue to, you know, run the world. So failure can turn into something else. Great. That sounds fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Waite, for sharing. Um, it is true that there will be times when um, others might not believe in you. Uh, and those are the times when you have to dig deep uh, and believe in yourself. 
and also reach out to the network that you have, the support system that you have, um, either personally and professionally, those people who can still raise you up um, during those times. And that's very important. Um, did anyone else want to share? Uh, can I share my story? So I mentioned that I was originally from Jamaica and I actually started North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina at 16 years old. And the reason is because our high school system in Jamaica, you do graduate from high school at the age 15 and 16. So it's a totally different education system. I did not consider myself to be an Einstein, but I worked hard and I know what I wanted to do. So when I stepped onto campus, I got a full ride to play volleyball. And I remember the first season, it was pretty difficult because when you're a college athlete, you do have to balance work and sports. So you have your games, you have practice, you have weight training, and then you have all your classes. And oftentimes the teachers don't see you much differently than their normal student because they expect you to do the work, show up to class, participate, and do well on their exams. So after my first year, we had a lot of games and a lot of tournaments. So you therefore oftentimes have to miss classes. And so there's resources provided to you like tutors, et cetera. I remember an advisor and to her credit, uh, or rather um, not to discredit her, she probably has seen a lot of students, a lot of athletes. And I remember telling her, I'm a volleyball player. I want to do medicine. Um, I've missed, I, I oftentimes miss a lot of classes, but I know I can get it done. And I'm, I'm assuming she used her own personal experience and kind of looked at me through those lens and said to me, I don't think you are going to make it to medicine because it's going to be difficult for you to keep up with your classes. I said, okay, that's fair. And I walked away from that. And I said to myself, she doesn't know me and she doesn't know the support system that I have. And the reason I say that is this is important that you surround yourself with people who A, know the goals that you have, B, are, are willing to support you and push you regardless of the obstacles. And as someone mentioned, it is oftentimes those people around you cling to, not because they do, they're doing what you want to do, but their worth ethic. So I had teammates who wanted to also do various things and they said, no, we're going to work hard and we're going to get it done. And to be honest, I was 16 years old and my mother helped me pack my suitcase because it's a huge financial burden for her to have taken care of three kids by herself. So I knew I did not have any other choice. So uh, the fear of failure also was a part of that. But long story short, I sit here today. I'm a sports medicine doc. I have done things that I too oftentimes thought that I wasn't capable of doing, but I didn't let that person's words affect or change the course of what I wanted to get done. It doesn't mean that I didn't have obstacles in the way, but I'm happy that when I went to her, I didn't go to her for her words per se, but I went to her to say, this is my plan. And it's up to you to get on this train with me and get help me to get there. But if you're not willing to go on that ride with me and help move and row that boat or help put some gas in this engine, then it's okay. You can come off at the next stop. And so I say that to say it's important that when people discourage you from doing things, it is okay. They don't know you. The people who see you and know you and, and know that you're working hard, those are the people who know you and those are the people that you should keep their words in the back of your head. By the end of the day, just as, as was just said, oftentimes the people who doubt you can also be that fuel to fuel you to get where you want to go. And so I will say that, you know, just be mindful of no's. A no is not necessarily the end of the road. It is oftentimes a detour to say, okay, I need to look somewhere else. And sometimes things happen where preparation meets opportunities. And then that takes you to the next level. Because I oftentimes, I believe that there's no such thing as luck. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Stennett. That was fantastic. So you touched on some things about kind of getting to that next stop, being to the next station um, and about goals. Um, can you, um, or do any of you um, kind of touch on what dreams or goals have inspired you to succeed um, and who or what helps you formulate and set those goals? 
Hi, everybody. So um, I've, very, I've been very goal driven even before I knew what goals were. <laughs> um, I think my, my mother um, just kind of made it part of our, our lifestyle. It wasn't necessarily something overly structured. We would just kind of sit and talk about what we liked and what we dreamed about. And um, I do recall having like a vision board um, when I was about, I think the picture may have been at the age of four or five, like my one ponytail over here, one ponytail over there. And like in my own handwriting, I wrote things about myself. And so most of it was um, were, were affirmations, but some of them were goals. And so um, that has for us as a family become a lifestyle. Um, as a parent now, I even, I, I, my mother and my son sit together and they spend at least, you know, an hour or two every time they're together, every every holiday or summer break and they rewrite the goals. And uh, it's just sort of been what I've, what I've done um, with respect to the industry that I participate in now. Um, I do have one of my, like my, team jacket, um, but but I've always been a fan of the Olympic movement, even as a child. Every time it was on, I'd stay up until the TV turned off when they played the, the, the national anthem. And um, every four years when Nike would put out an Olympic shoe, I would get it. Well, I wasn't even thinking about sports medicine at the time. You know, I was always an athlete, I was in sports, but I was not even thinking about it until I went to school in Atlanta in the middle of the uh, the Atlanta games period of time, everything was Olympic, everything. But on my wall were um, pictures of what were then, um, it was the women's dream team. And later they became the WNBA. They weren't the WNBA yet, but I had them on my wall. I had the track and field athletes kind of on my wall. In my mind, I thought I was gonna be one of them. <laughs> So my, my goal was something completely different. Um, but as you continue to put your goals in front of you, if you write it out, if you put a picture of it somewhere, you are constantly drawn to those images. And, and if it's something that you're really passionate about, you will start to align the tasks that you accomplish and um, everything that you pursue will sort of lead you to that. Doesn't mean that I'll always get every single thing that I want. Of course, I, like I said, I thought I'd be an athlete at that level. I'm not, but I'm still there with them. So I'm still a part of the, it's still part of my dream. And, you know, I don't have to do as much hard work with the eating and, and workouts as they do. <laughs> yeah, I, I love what uh, Dr. Hassard is saying. And, and similar to her story, you know, when you ask the question, Dr. Hassard kind of who kind of helped shape your goals, you know, it was my mother without question. You know, she was my foundation. She continues to be my rock. And she was the one that initiated kind of my drive and my passions that I've had to achieve what I've been able to achieve in my career thus far. Um, I, I wanted to kind of talk to how, like, like the, again, the skill of writing a goal and how, how you formulate goals, how you write goals, how you work towards goals. I think that's important, the, the how behind that and that process and what that looks like. I'm a big believer in the SMART goal. So it's an acronym, S-M-A-R-T, S being specific. So the goal should have some level of specificity. So kind of knowing what your goal is or goals are, so that specificity. M, it's measurable. So something that you can actually put a, t a, a, a measurement to. So the, the amount of time that you would put into that goal, um, what does that goal look like and how do you reach it? Okay, and, and what happens when you do achieve it and that it's attainable. So you want to make the goals attainable and something that you can realistically, which is the next letter R, realistic. So those kind of work together, attainable and realistic in that you can truly achieve it. So if your goal is to be a, a, a sports medicine doctor, physical therapist, athletic trainer, et cetera, as all the different professions are represented on this panel, well, at this stage in your life, it may not be if you're in middle school that I want to get into physical therapy school next year. But it may be that I have a 3.5 GPA or something along those lines. But now if you're a senior in college, 
then that might be that your goal then is, is that you're going to get into physical therapy school or med school or athletic training. So knowing that making the goal realistic and making it specific to the stage in life that you're in. And then, and then that last letter, that T, putting an actual time to it, creating a deadline. I think that when you have action items, when you have goals, it's important to have a deadline and that you hold yourself to that deadline. So in that way, you don't procrastinate. So that way, you don't sit on it. And that way that you're actively working towards that goal. So then taking those smart type of goals and then writing them down again, just like Dr. Hassel said. So use the vision board. I know for myself, I use, I wrote them down on my desktop on a Word document. It's somewhere where I can see it. Maybe it be a wall in your bedroom, maybe it be on your refrigerator, but just somewhere in which you can constantly see those goals. And then really taking those SMART goals and then put them in two buckets, two categories. So one would be the short-term goal versus the long-term goal. And another word for long-term goal is that telescope goal. So then if you're listening to this and you do want to go and be, become a physician or a physical therapist or a dietitian or whatever your goal is, well, then that would be the telescope or the long-term goal. And then having all those short-term goals that are working towards that long-range goal and then achieving that goal. And then really, you know, understanding that you may uh, be successful and in, in achieving some goals and, and that's great but also prepare yourself that you may fail in a goal and if that happens which might be inevitable because in life we don't always achieve every single goal then when you do fail use that as fire use that as your energy that propels you and fuels you to then achieve your next goal as you continue to work through your journey and accomplishing your goals that, hey. that is really helpful i was just gonna i was just throwing in there that was really helpful i like watching it in the chat and i'm just wanted to let everyone know, we'll try to figure out a way to capture some of that advice so we can send it back to you um, so that you don't have to be scrambling to take notes and you can just listen. So we'll, we'll do our best to capture this, all this really rich information. Um, I guess the question was uh, what or who helps uh, you formulate and set your goals? Uh, I would say my family uh, was a big uh, component of the reason why I chose the path that I chose and also to set forth my own goals. Uh, I know where I came from and I say three things to, to everyone out there. Know where you came from, know where you're at now, know where you want to be. And that kind of kind of you know puts the, the steps in place of what you're really looking forward to and what you're trying to uh, do. For me, I knew that I wanted to do uh, uh, medicine and wanted to be a sports doctor. And I had friends and people in places that helped me accountable. So I, I want to say my biggest uh, drive and goals are the fact that I told too many people so I couldn't fail. <laughs> so, uh, and those same people that I told were very, very um, uh, driven themselves for what goals they had set forth. So it's kind of like iron sharpens iron. So we had to fall back on each other and we built from one another and learning from each other. So um, if you have a good set of friends and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm ex-athletes, I'm competitive. <laughs> so uh, even if you have other individuals of uh, just a uh, competitive mindset, such as yourself, and just get a good pool of people that you can kind of bounce ideas off and, and say, hey, do you think I can do this? They say no, and you say, I you know, prove you wrong. Uh, just like Dr. Stennett said, uh, I had an academic advisor when I was an uh, undergrad that told me that um, I would have to probably do another track uh, or go some other route instead of doing medicine uh, because this individual themselves actually didn't get into medical school. And I said, okay, in lesser terms, I guess, outside of medicine, all right, bet. <laughs> now we're going to do something different. And uh, I, I just turned it on. I'm like, I'm not going to let someone deter me from the fact that what I want to do is what I want to do, not what he uh, wants me to do. So that's, that's another thing, another component of trying to put your goals down. And I, I'm a strong, strong believer in writing them down as well, uh, putting them in a place that you can see, um, you know, after a while, it just kind of soaks in that that's what you want. You get tunnel vision to a certain extent. Um, so that's, that's, that's my take on it. Monique, can I just add one thing to that as well as we're talking about goals, because mm -hmm. I, I recognize that we're speaking with high school students as well. Um, you may actually be preparing for a position that doesn't even exist yet. So stay open-minded as well. Yeah, I just really great advice, everybody. I think that I would highlight that I think all of us have had a situation where somebody has um, challenged our goals and maybe we thought we weren't going to get be able to get there. And so you can see so many people have that experience and they are, they did it and they were able to overcome it. And I really love the advice around like, the visioning and uh, writing things down and 
and seeing that out there as a visual reminder and also writing it there so that you have that in, in your mindset um, and telling people, telling people is another great thing because you tell people they remember and they'll remind you about it. I think I told people I wanted to be a doctor when I was in third grade writing that autobiography and, um, and, and there you go. So um, I'm, I'm wondering, cause there is a lot, you know, we were talking to middle and high schoolers. And so what advice do you guys have like for like the middle schoolers and the high schoolers about like classes to take or um, maybe internships or other things that they may want to get involved in that may spin into other opportunities and and what kind of would you recommend for what you're looking for when you're moving into um, the classes that you get to select as a high schooler and I you know what I'm I might pick on someone because I want to make sure we get all of our panelists in there. So I might pick on Amy because I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, uh, that's a great question. And thank you, everyone on this panel. Such an impressive panel that we have here. The students who are listening in today, um, you guys are incredibly grateful to be seeing this, if I, could, if I could imagine myself being exposed to something like this when I was in high school and middle school, I don't know, I, this is such an amazing opportunity. Um, to answer the question that Dr. Burton uh, uh, just asked in, in terms of um, uh, having, having uh, resources um, and uh, uh, repeat, repeat that one more time for me, <laughs> Dr. Burton. I was just thinking like, you know, when we go, when we go into like high school and you sometimes have op options of classes to take, or even at, when you're in middle school and you're preparing to go to high school and to take classes, what kind of classes do you need to think about taking that will set you up to be able to go into, um, into universities prepared? But then also like, I mean, a, a spinoff of that is, and maybe you can choose whatever one speaks to you more. Is there something that some advice you'd give to your middle or high school or self to be able to get to where you are today. And you, and you do some pretty cool things that <laughs> I'm happy to have you share if you want to. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think uh, in this field of sports medicine, I think we can't go wrong to look, look into starting with anatomy and physiology. I think if, if you're going to be in sports medicine, start off with the foundation of anatomy and physiology, go into learning about movement, kinesiology, I think that's gonna open the doors to a lot of different fields and it is the common ground that connects all of us on this panel. Um, and uh, me personally, I didn't know that I wanted to be a physical therapist until my third year in college. So I changed my major about five or six times um, and went through a lot of different uh, uh, challenges in, along the way to get to where I am today. Um, and uh, in, in terms of a starting point, I think anatomy and physiology is, is a great one. Um, and uh, one thing I'll just mention is if, if you are on this path, especially I'm trying to think back to when I was in high school and middle school, I had a lot of academic challenges and uh, I actually was, was a student that didn't perform very well academically. And uh, it was very hard to attain a, a good grade in class, a good GPA in high school, a good GPA in college. And, uh, I had to uh, take exams several times, the GRE several times in order to get a, a minimum GPA to get into just graduate school, which I was ultimately able to get into USC, the number one physical therapy school at the time when I applied. Um, I just wanna encourage you that if you have these academic failures, um, just to uh, try again, I think that success is more so about persistence and, and not so much about uh, uh, um, you know, if you're smart or if you're, you're, you're intelligent, I, it's, it's really about just persisting through those, those hurdles. Um, yes, I didn't want to go too far there. <laughs> um, as a high school teacher, what, if you are in middle school, uh, every state has something around the name of career technical education. Um, at my high school, at Dorsey High School in South Central Los Angeles, we have a sports medicine and law magnet, and I am in charge of our sports medicine program. And so I teach medical terminology, sports medicine, a physical therapy, and an emergency response course. And so if you are in middle school, I would look at 
which high schools have these career technical education programs in the patient care pathway um, that can lead you into those type of classes if you want to do sports medicine specifically. But there are also other career technical educational programs such as biotechnology, um, some nursing, some dentist programs that are available to lots of students. It just depends on the high school and if they actually have that program available. And then once you're in high school, if your high school doesn't have any kind of program like that, you can look for internships. Um, I know for my high school students, we try to get them internships with Kaiser Permanente. We have about three Kaiser Permanentes out surrounding us and they have a lot of high school internship opportunities for high school students. Um, in Los Angeles, Southern California, Cedar sinai also has internship opportunities for high school students. Um, and check to see, as um, Amy mentioned, anatomy and physiology, and I was just telling someone in the chat, I think in any healthcare profession in sports medicine, if you got your anatomy down, things are just going to click and be a lot easier for you. And so looking at what community colleges have kinesiology courses you can take in the summer or have anatomy and physiology courses that you can take in the summer, those type of things can then give you a one-up once you are in college and once you're ready to you know take get your bachelor's um, degree or even if you if even if you want to go to community college i 100 percent want to emphasize that's okay at times with our situations being first generation college students trying to figure out FAFSA on your own because your parents don't know what the heck FAFSA is i know it can be a little discouraging it can be scary and so community college is okay. It's a good route to go through. In California, in Southern California, community college is free um, for two years for most students. And that is a huge financial um, savior to most of our high school students. So even if you take those summer courses, those summer kinesiology courses, you can continue that education and maybe even you know take some EMT courses just to get that under your belt and learn different skills if you want to go into physical therapy or if you want to go into athletic training. Um, because at, at one point, we all deal with emergency medicine and emergency injuries. And so even having things like that under your belt would be something really good um, to look for. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Merriman. Th those are really um, good tidbits of advice. Um, I had a, a quickie thing that I could piggyback on that, and that's just that there's not, um, even at the junior high school level or the high school level, it doesn't have to be a sports medicine pro. If you think you want to go into sports medicine, it doesn't have to be a sports medicine program. It can be anything science, anything that's extra educational that shows that you are engaged and you are interested and you are dedicated and you can meet people that then might write you letters of recommendation that are gonna be different than everybody else from your school. And so don't think that it has to be just something that's related to sports medicine. If it's in any way related, zoology, like there's sometimes there's programs at the local zoo that you can be a docent at, and that's kind of related to science. And so, I mean, quite, if you're gonna be a veterinarian, but so don't like limit yourself by thinking, oh, it only has to be sports medicine to count because as one of the other panelists said, you, I think it was um, uh, Angel, you, you might be preparing for a career that doesn't even exist yet or that you don't know. Like I, I didn't know that physical medicine and rehab even existed. You know, I, I thought I was gonna go into OBGYN or so, you know, something else like that. And it just ended up being there. So you might think, oh, I wanna go into medicine and then you might fall in love with athletic training or you might fall in love with veterinary medicine. You don't know, but getting all those broad experiences. It doesn't have to be just sports medicine. It can prepare you for a life in a healthcare related field or a science related field. Great. Thank you. I think we're going to do looking at the time, be mindful. Um, we're going to do one more question and then we're going to open it up um, to Q and A um, from our attendees. One last question. How has being a person of color affected your experience as a healthcare professional and particularly for the population that you serve? Uh, I'll go. Uh, so being a person of color, once again, I am from Jamaica, so I'm an um, Afro-Caribbean descent. Um, I attended University of Florida for undergraduate um, and also for my, my residency. And I am the only 
uh, well, I'm the last, uh, I guess you could say black male uh, in my residency class um, and in my program for the past like nine years. And I was the only black male in my department as a physician. Uh, so the fact that when you're in residency, you tend to deal with um, uh, the individuals in the lower SES class, socioeconomic class, um, and disparity, disparity wise that a lot of them tend to be uh, individuals that have um, black ethnicity or Hispanic, uh, Hispanic ethnicity. And I feel as if being one of the only black doctors in my residency program, a lot of the, uh, the patients felt comfortable with me and they divulged things that they wouldn't tell other individuals. And a lot of them wanted to come over to be part of my panel, uh, which I, you know, I totally appreciate. Um, I had one of the most memorable things. I had a, a patient that was a uh, African American female. She was uh, in in um, I think a, a junior or senior in high school, and she actually cried in the room and told me she I was the first black doctor that she ever met. So to have that type of uh, impact on people is is really rewarding. Um, then the other aspect is the fact that I'm the only black male in my residency and in, in portions of my, my hospital, uh, you have individuals that may one question you sometimes, uh, which is not the, 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 the most, uh, I can't say, I, I can't formulate the word, kind of upsets you, <laughs> but you have to just work hard and show them that you are there and you are there for a reason and you are a MD for a reason, which I have to do have done multiple times. Um, and you just have to show that you had the work ethic and actually work harder than some individuals to get what you obtain. Uh, it's kind of, you know, it's a sad, sad world that we live in, but that's that's how it goes sometimes. Um, I hopefully answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I can add on to that too. I think the best part about me where I'm doing just pediatrics, uh, I think it's, you know, when I'm on the sideline and covering a football game at whatever game that I'm at, and obviously I'm helping all the athletes, you know, I, I think that there is something special when, you know, you're on the sideline and their you know, majority of the team is, is of color and they know that you're there for them and for their safety. And I think that sometimes is inspiring and just not saying anything, but just when you roll up with your badge and ready to roll and, and they give you a little pound or, hey, what's up, doc? I think that is a special thing to me. And I think on the other hand too, you know, I, I speak Spanish as well. Uh, I love the look in the eye when, when I've got an athlete down, I got to update the family and they're looking nervous because they don't speak English. I live in, in Arizona, um, boom, I flip a switch, I go Spanish and just the, the joy, the love that they have uh, for somebody who can do that, I think, um, those are kind of the things that keep you going and, and keep you inspired to know that uh, you have that uh, special connection with a lot of the patients that, that maybe not everybody else has. So uh, jumping off of uh, what Dr. Hall said, um, I am one of the co-founders for Latinx Athletic Trainers. And one of the reason we decided that this group was very needed was the lack of representation um, in athletic training in general. Uh, the demographic of athletic training, 81% of athletic trainers are white. And the lack of representation of care for our Latinx students, our Hispanic and Latinx students. There are many healthcare dis disparities in the black and brown community and health literacy and, and communicating is probably one of the biggest. I find in my setting at the high school and specifically with the Latinx population and our culture and the way we feel about going to see a doctor, especially if you have athletes who are undocumented and scared of going to the doctor, having someone who has been in their shoes, who looks like them, who speaks their language is extremely important. and. My high school is predominantly black and brown and being able to relate to my students and my Latinx and Spanish speaking students has increased the care 100%. My first year when I got there, they were scared to come to me. 
they didn't want to tell me about a sprained ankle. They would rather go see a sobador um, or a curandero instead of coming to me, which will make the injuries worse. But as you build these relationships with your patients and, and they get to know you and they know that you speak the same language, that, like Dr. Hall said, that switch just clicks. And they are just so more open to sharing what's actually wrong with them. And more importantly, they're willing to do what they need to do to become better after an injury or whatever is wrong with them. So being a person of color, not only is important because we need more healthcare professionals who look like us, but we understand when we, when we treat someone who looks like us and who is of our ethnicity, we understand what their concerns are when they go to a physician. We understand what their work, what they can face when they leave us right? Do they have anyone who's going to assist them with those physical therapy exercises when they get home, um, who can take them to follow-up appointments, who can take them to go pick up the prescription pills, things of that nature. And so we can further provide better resources for our patients to make sure that they can handle things that, that they, they're able to handle. Thank you. I actually want to address both um, Bianca's question as well as a, a question in the chat. Uh, Gabby, you asked an excellent question. <laughs> from the action, right? And I think it relates to what Dr. White just mentioned, what Dr. Merriman just mentioned. Look, we're a panel of people of color. All of, you know, you see all of us, you see our faces. That's the one thing we have in common. We're, we're people of color, black, Latino, um, you know, Asian, et cetera, right? And we understand that, that being people of color in not only sports medicine, but just in healthcare period, we are going to then be underrepresented. And, to, and Gabby, to kind of speak to your question about affirmative action, when I was an undergraduate, so I went to a PWI, a predominantly white institution for undergraduate school. And when I got accepted into USC, so you know, a lot of us know each other and um, Dr. Atmore is a sister to me and we went to the same program. So when I got accepted to USC for physical therapy school, Back in undergrad, before I left, a lot of, and I played college football, a lot of my teammates or a few of my teammates, a few of the, the people I went to school with said, oh, well, you must have got accepted because of affirmative action. They either said it directly to me or just the whispering and the gossip kind of not directly to me. That was say, stated to me. And of course, it, it angers you. You know, it gets you fired up. It makes you emotional. You know, let's just be real and just be honest about it. These are the types of ignorant comments that can make you have an emotional response and create the churning in your stomach. Um, you know, I encourage you guys all to read not just books within school. Obviously, take your grades and read those, but also books outside of school. And I read this book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the things this book talks about is the circle of control, right? So you draw a circle. Everything within the circle of things that you can control control everything outside the circle of things that you can't control. And the reality is, is that you're never going to be able to control ignorance and other people's thoughts. So again, going back to something I said earlier about kind of that fuel, letting things fuel you, when you hear these comments, Gabby, and, and for those of you who the other students who have been told things about affirmative action, what you got to do is again, let that fuel you in your journey. You know, Dr. White talked about how she had this experience of an ignorant physician and it fueled her and her journey going on to, to, to John Hopkins, right? So you're not going to be able to control everything that's said about you. You're not going to be able to control people's thoughts, especially when they're fueled in ignorance. But what you can do is control your actions, your energies, and your thoughts about yourself. Always understanding that you are good enough, that you are more than good enough for the assignment. You're more than good enough for not only school assignments, but if you get accepted into certain programs, you deserve a place at that table. If you get a really cool job in the future, you're more than qualified and you will be more than qualified for that opportunity in that position. So you can control your thoughts, you can control your own energy, and you can control your kind of work ethic as you work towards these things. And then the final thing I'll say is, is that be prepared, just like Dr. White said of him being the only physician in his program, um, you know, look, less than 5% of physical therapists in this country are black. Um, I, I was the first physical therapist in the history of professional baseball to work in that, in that sport and, and baseball has been around for over a hundred years, right? And so what does that mean? That chances are Blacks, Latinos, Asians, when you get to a certain level of your career or academic journey, you may not see people that look like you, 
be prepared for that and then be willing to be the change that famous quote be willing to be the change you want to see and do your part in changing that so then you can reach back to the next generation and bring them up and you have people that look like you in that setting as well so i want to absolutely go oh, and ask the, the panel something really quickly mm -hmm. i think that i'm going to get the answer that i suspect but how many of you just by a show of hands have had somebody tell you that you aren't going to be able to do it or that you're there for um, affirmative action or that you have an experience or somebody told you I can't, you can't you're not going to be able to try something different so we all did it I mean I think that I think that that just really shows a lot I mean I think that we all have their pain they may be painful memories and I think we've all certainly like you know gone through them in ways that um that weren't necessarily fun at the time. I certainly actually in the past year even reflected on some of the experiences just in thinking about all the racial tensions. Um, and they're not necessarily memories that I enjoy, but I also realized like I did it, you know, like somebody told me I couldn't, somebody told me that there shouldn't be black students in medical school. Somebody told me that. I mean, ast astounding things that people will say to you, but we all did it and we're all here. And those obstacles motivated us. And, can, I, can um, I just add yeah, one thing yeah. to that, Monique, because we can get, um, unfortunately, we can fall into the trap of thinking that you can just dig yourself up and pull yourself up by the bootstraps, Yeah, because that's what society has told us. But I want to make it abundantly clear to this middle school and high school group that this is a time and day and age where you no longer have to internalize those external messages just because that's their issue and not yours. So I just felt the need to just clear the air and say that. Yeah, thank and, you, Dr. Brutus. It's uh, yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, and we're all. I just was going to add. We're all also here. We're here for a reason because we want to be able to support you in your journeys. And so, yes, I think like you know what Dr. Brutus said. I think is a really important point. And I also just want to make sure that you know that we we all are are rooting for you. And that's exactly why we all join this this panel. We're doing this is because. We, we want to see that change go on and we want to help you. So uh, um, I, I agree and, and to echo those statements, um, there will be times when um, you all will be challenged. We all have been challenged um, based on the color of their skin, based on our gender, based on where we come from. Uh, and the thing to realize is you absolutely deserve to be where you are. And because you guys are our next generation of leaders. You are the ones who will keep carrying uh, you, this profession and other professions forward, um, expounding upon that, reinventing, reimagining, um, and contributing greatness um, to this world and for the people and populations that you serve. Um, so um, despite the fact that there will be um, people who um, judge, uh, who question, um, who um, kind of challenge uh, your ability to be there, know that you have what it takes to be and where you've gotten thus far, um, and that you have the skills and the people surrounding you, that support network to help pushing you forward um, to keep achieving greatness. And that, that is, again, why Dr. Burns said, we all are here for you um, to help you. Um, so, Dr. Edison, I just want to add really quickly, you said something that I think it's super important, and I want to add a term for that, imposter syndrome. You just said that whatever space that you're in, I'm going to paraphrase, whatever space that you're in, just know that you belong there. People may throw out a um, affirmative action, for example, or, you know, um, pull yourself up by the boostering. We don't have to hand anything to you. And so oftentimes I do feel that um, these students may have those feelings and there is a term for it, imposter syndrome. And I'll let you guys know that we all probably have experienced imposter syndrome and sometimes continue to experience it because oftentimes we're the only person of color at the table. And I personally have felt that way, but then I remember that my, me being in that space allows me to bring certain tools to the table, table whether it's cultural, um, language, especially for Latinx, um, 
um, um, uh, uh, healthcare providers, as well as being able to advocate for people that look like us. And so in those moments when you feel that, you know what, they're gonna find out that I'm not supposed to be here. They're gonna find out that I'm not qualified. They're gonna find out that, you know, um, I, I, my greens weren't good enough. I, in those moments, we have to remember, number one, those feelings are, 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 you're feeling those feelings, but at the same time, with the support system that you have, with people around you, share those thoughts with them and said, you know what, I feel this way and I don't want to feel this way because I know I'm supposed to be here. Dr. Edison on this meeting said, you are supposed to be where you're supposed to be. And I want you guys to know that, that it does happen, but it doesn't mean you give in to those feelings. So I wanted to put that out there, imposter syndrome. I did not know what that was until medical school because I constantly felt that I wasn't good enough to be in medical school. Thank you so much, Dr. Sennett. Um, so, oh I, yes, Dr. White, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Edison and Dr. Sennett. Um, I was actually gonna bring up imposter syndrome. So you, you, you took it and stole my thunder, but I'm appreciative of it. Uh, I really wanna put it out there that uh, you are better than you give yourself credit for. And that's, the, that's what people tend to fall back and forget on sometimes. Uh, the same individuals, Gabby, I was reading your comments. I, my heart goes out to you because that's, that's not right in any way. And yes, I believe everyone on this panel has had faced something similar. Um, at the end of the day, people that are less confident in themselves try to plant seeds of, uh, to, to kind of bring down your own confidence. And that's their weakness. And someone said this to me a while back, and I hope it kind of translates to you all, everyone that's on the panel, also anyone, everyone that's uh, in attendance. If something, if you can see something bothering you in five years, if it can't bother you in five years, technically, don't give it five minutes of your time. So that's, it's easier said than done, but I promise it has alleviated a lot of stress in my own life. So I just want to put that out there and hopefully you all can um, take that as well. Thank you so much, Dr. White. And um, with this string of comments, I'll end with um, Dr. Maya Angelou's uh, poem, Still I Rise, uh, harkens to kind of these sentiments. I encourage everybody to read it because it's a very powerful poem and one that will still continue to be applicable and transcend um, time. So with this, I wanna be mindful of people's time. I wanna give opportunities for some Q and A um, from our attendees. So now we're gonna open it up. Uh, doctor, uh, and everybody um, can um, turn on their video if they would like. Um, for these questions, what we're going to do, um, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and then we'll try to get to um, as many as we can with the time remaining. And um, as people are thinking about any questions or if they want to, um, what we will do is um, with the chat, there's a lot of resources that um, were um, put forth and some other questions. We will try and culminate all of that and send it out um, after this event. I see a hand raised, uh, Noah uh, Dooley, if you want to go ahead, please. Um, yeah, so I've already committed to the college. I'm a senior in high school. And I was just wondering, what was the biggest hurdles as far as in sports medicine once you enter college? What were those big first walls you came up against? Chemistry sucked for me. Amen. Dang that dang chemistry. Oh my God, chemistry. <laughs> I'm not, uh, math is just not my friend. And chemistry just was just that one class um, that put me in academic probation my freshman year and I had to retake it um, and I forced myself to spend extra time and learning it and finding a tutor and it sucked but um, having to commit to bettering that grade so that I would get myself out of academic probation um, is what I had to do uh, and I also found a different teacher who um, kind of got my learning style. My first chemistry teacher just taught chemistry from a PowerPoint and I could not learn that way. It just was not for me. Um, and so I went literally office door to door and asked chemistry teachers if they had any open spaces in their summer courses and, um, you know, asked them how they taught because this is how I learn. And I ended up 
taking another course and I passed with an A. So I think it was a huge difference to failing the first chemistry course. Um, but I think, you know, that was my struggle with chemistry and anatomy initially, but I think, oh, I forget who said in the chat, anatomy, it will be secondhand to you eventually. The more you see it and the more you, you go through it, it becomes kind of like a muscle memory. And so the, the earlier exposure you can get to anatomy and become more comfortable with it, I, I think it'll definitely assist you once you get to college. Thank you, Dr. Marion and Marion. And I think you bring up a really good point about failing or failure. Um, failing is not an F word, okay? Um, it is a learning opportunity. Uh, it does not define you. It should not define you. How you come out from that, what you learn from that to make yourself better should define you. Um, so I think all of us, I can be rest assured, I will bet my whole paycheck that all of us on this panel has uh, have failed um, at least more than once in life. Um, and and those, have, those failures have gotten us to where we are today. Yeah, I... Um... I think there's someone else that I saw raise their hand. I was just going to share that also as well is that I definitely, um, I struggled with physics. It gave me test taking anxiety, which I didn't know what that was until I got to college. And I learned some really important things that helped me in the future. And so even though I didn't like that experience of learning <laughs> that I had test taking anxiety, I um, learned how to overcome that by figuring out how I needed to prepare for tests and how I needed to ask for help. Um, so I think that we all have experienced a, an opportunity where uh, an, a, maybe an unfortunate opportunity that led to an, actually a great opportunity to understand our learning styles so that we can benefit from it in the future. Um, I think there was another hand up, but the hand went away. So if somebody- I could, add, a, I could yeah. add something on the yeah. preparation part. I think um, there was two things that yeah, and I will say, like, my, my mom was a principal, my dad was a teacher, uh, I, I was, school was not um, particularly difficult for me, but I will say, uh, time management was, and, you know, when you get to college, you don't realize that, like, it's not like the bell's over and you go to the next class or whatever, right, like, you can play video games all you want, if you know, and do what you want to do. And sometimes you you don't really realize that that's a skill to be learned, um, as well as asking for help. So, to me, I had very good grades, but asking for help made it a whole lot easier and allowed me to to do things um, that I didn't know that I had time to do because instead of spending hours and hours studying, I had A's, but I still had a tutor. And I use that to my advantage because the school makes that available to you. So I think sometimes even though you think that you, you know everything or you're, you're well prepared, it doesn't hurt to um, get help uh, just to make it that much easier. Great. Thank you. I think there was one question that came up in the chat. Um, that asked about what do universities or colleges look at when they choose to accept you or not? And that's a very good question. If someone wants to, I can take that. Um, I can take that question. So I think it, it's probably been touched on a few times, but it's important that you guys are what we call well-rounded. And what well-rounded means, it is amazing that you guys get good grades and you your coursework is good, that's great. But get involved with your community. There's, um, for example, when I was in undergrad, there was a Ronald McDonald House and you can get involved with the Ronald McDonald House from high school, middle school, even college. And this is a house that, that basically caters to family who need help while they're getting treatment at the hospital. And so I'd volunteer by helping prepare meals, um, help with donation or fundraising events. Your local um, food bank is a good, good place to start. So it's important that when you guys look at your accomplishments, right? So one of the biggest things you guys wanna do is get good grades, so awesome. But also get, in, get involved with some extracurricular activities. Um, in addition, I'm sure high school and medical, medical schools, they have clubs and organizations so you could be a part of the Latina uh, um, ex, uh, um, 
um, club. I was a part of the Caribbean club in college. And so I basically was able to get out, get um, together with a, whole, a bunch of folk, kids and students from the Caribbean and we did certain things and certain projects. So I would say be well-rounded. It's not just about your grade, but be well-rounded. Um, in addition, you can do other things such as um, try leadership roles. So you may volunteer for the Ronald McDonald House, but you might be the secretary or the vice president for the African Student Association or the, the Japanese Student Association, or you could be a part of the math club. And just because we're all in medicine, it does not mean that you have to do medicine only. There's individuals that I know that have majored in Spanish or architecture or engineer or business. And so even though it's important that you get those prereqs, prerequisites, including I think anatomy and physiology is a great, great class to take. Chemistry, unfortunately, we cannot escape it. It is a part of the journey. Um, but, you know, minor in a second language or, or take a second language. I can tell you living in Miami, Span it was more Spanish speaking than English. And I'm from Jamaica and I took French. And so Spanish was new to me. And if there's one thing I wish I'd done was Spanish because you just, I just never knew I would need it so much. Um, but now I'm learning Spanish in my thirties and I'm just like, man, I wish I'd taken advantage of that opportunity in high school and college. And so I would say be, be well-rounded, expand, you know, do cooking when you get to college or in high school learn how to cook because when you get to college guess what mom and dad are not going to cook for you especially you have the kitchen you know take a sewing class take a music class take something that's going to take um some of that stress and pressure you feel and that's something that you enjoy um and so these are things that it doesn't matter if you want to do uh sports medicine or athletic training or nutrition i think those are things that all these programs are going to want to look for what is unique about you everybody's going to come with the sciences and you know, they may have played sports, but they say, oh, tell me about um, this Latina ex uh, club that you're in. You know, what are some of the things to do? Tell me about this Ronald McDonald experience. What is the, what is the Ronald McDonald house? And so those are great conversation um, pieces, especially during interviews. Can I just add one thing to that? Uh, it might sound a little unorthodox, but you have the opportunity to get involved with something that's called Toastmasters. It's an opportunity to train and refine how you speak. Obviously it's targeting public speaking, but you'd be surprised how much you can tell the confidence that exudes in interviews. And public speaking is a way to refine those skills. And it's actually a, a, a skill that will transcend the interview process anyway. So if you have the opportunity and the time to do that, I would say look into Toastmasters or something similar to that to just start honing public speaking skills because it matters. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Brutus. Yeah, I, um, does anyone else have anything to add or we'll try and move on to the next question. Um, I can add something real quick. Um, and as it pertains to um, your resume and um, being well-rounded like Dr. Stennon had emphasized, um, <clears throat> for, for those of you who are having issues academically, like getting your GPA. Um, I was one of them. I think it's important to note that, especially in this day and age where the, the amount of applications that are going through these colleges, I can only imagine is like multiplied exponentially compared to when we applied to school via paper and all that. Um, so it's even more competitive. And um, in, in addition to being well-rounded, just thinking about compensating for your weaknesses. So for me personally, my weakness was my, my GPA. Um, I had I had made the minimal GPA, but with that I needed to showcase why I uh, why I'm I'm needing to be a, a part of this program. And so think about those things, how you can stand out because you're going to have so much competition. Um, and unfortunately, the 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 way the system is right now, we have to put everything who we are as a person on a piece of paper, which is really hard to do. Um, so I would just uh, reiterate the fact that. You know, even if you have a, a low GPA, you can you can compensate for that with with your extracurricular activities and and your volunteering um, uh, experiences. And as you're going through these volunteer experiences, doing it with a, an intentional purpose and 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 really truly diving into that volunteer experience and finding your 
your passion and your drive and what you feel relentless to pursue, because that's going to transcend even past your, your college um, application process and carry into your ultimate career. Thank you so much, Dr. Atmore. Uh, I agree. I think that, you know, as you look to hone in and on build on your craft and yourself, um, I can't stress enough the importance on building on yourself as a person. Um, yes, you need to you study hard and and do well. Um, but you know we can have we can have robots, but you actually need to be a fantastic human being and leader. Um, and um, if you don't develop those skills, those interpersonal skills, those relationship skills, um, it's going to hurt you um, more than a C in physics. I think Suma had her hand raised. Suma, do you, um, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I could ask a question. Um, so my question was basically like, what advice would you give to your younger self? Don't get too tangled up in your boyfriend or girlfriend. I mean, you can get temporarily tangled up with them, but make sure you use birth control if you're going to get tangled up and whoever it is you're getting tangled up with. And don't go where they're going to go to school because they got in somewhere. Um, because you need it, if you got into a better school, which I had this whole conversation, I went to my better school, but it ended up being challenging for that person that I was tangled up with at the time. And I, who is no longer tangled up with me, and he's missing all this backyard situation that I got going on here. So just remember to not get tangled up with yourself, live your life. This is 2021 or whatever, use birth control so you don't have to make choices about certain things that you don't want to have to make choices about that can make your journey even that much more harder, not impossible, but that much more difficult. Advice to younger self. Real talk. I, I know I'm not a panelist, but I wanted to add something. I something that I that has really struck me over the over times in making decisions is that I think often we know, like there's like you have like a like a kind of like a heart feeling or like a gut feeling about things. And I wish that I was able to listen to that as a younger person to help me guide my choices, right? Because I think that on paper, you can get into, you can get into these schools or you can have these opportunities, but there's usually something that's like drawing you towards one. And I certainly know in choosing some of that, my um, choices later after I was out of, out of college, I sometimes was struck by like, wow, I'm being really drawn in this direction, even though it wasn't necessarily what I would have thought on paper. And so I think being able to like, you know, listen, like write down the things that are important to you and ask yourself the questions about um, choices that you're making. And usually there's something inside of you that will also tell you a bit about which direction you wanna go. And so it maybe sounds a little bit, I'm a yoga teacher also, a little bit out there, but I do think that there's a lot that you, like you know inside and so let yourself listen to that as well. But certainly all those things that Brandy said too, very important. <laughs> I feel like Brandy and I are living parallel worlds. Amen to that. And yes, Monique, I am a yoga instructor as well. <laughs> um, really succinctly say yes to all the things that your instructors have suggested that you consider, because there are things that they may see in you that you, you don't see in yourself. And it's priceless. I would say uh, to my younger self, confidence, 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 because <laughs> you second guess a lot of things. Uh, I, I would think I was a confident person, but looking at where I'm at now, I definitely could have been more eager and more confident growing up in middle school and high school. Um, you know, athlete, homecoming king, all that type of stuff I did, but confidence builds upon itself. And I think if I could go back in time and tell myself that, you know, do this and don't worry about it. It would really, really help me out where I'm at right now. Um, <laughs> the imposter syndrome is real, like we st uh, stated earlier. And I think I had some of that growing up too. So if we could have just broke those barriers, I think I'd have been uh, a lot more eager to be a, a better individual all around, I guess you can say. I, I wanted to just add something real quick because I know that um, a couple of our 
we're over and I want to be respectful of people's time, but I, a couple of our panelists need to hop off. So um, if there's, a, I know one of them has to go. If you wanted to leave any parting words, Alicia, feel free to jump in. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys, I do have to drop off, but um, I'm glad that there is a, a technical term for the imposter syndrome because I definitely had it. And I still sometimes still do have it, especially when we're trying to speak up for planning an Olympic games. It's trying so hard to go on. So, um, you know, I, I do think that, uh, I, I can't remember who said it, don't let something bother you for five minutes that'll not have a place in five years. I Gosh, that would help me so much every day. Um, so I think there's so many things that um, if you just continue to follow where you think you want to end up and pursue where your interests are, I think that's one of the biggest things for me was, um, I was truly interested in the area that I'm working in now, and I feel extremely lucky to call it a job. And so as long as you're pursuing those areas that are, are really where your heart is, I think, um, I mean, it, it makes it all worthwhile and um, every day is very fulfilling. So thank you everybody for your time. I really enjoyed being part of the, the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glass. Um, this has been this has been so wonderful. Um, I really do want to thank all the panelists um, for coming on and, and dedicating their their time and their space and uh, their thoughts um, and their wisdom. Uh, and I really, truly, truly, uh, for the bottom of my heart, want to want to thank the attendees. Um, you know, you young folks. Um, could have done anything. You're, you're all over the country, spanning from California all the way over to Washington, D.C. and Atlanta and, uh, and um, New Hampshire and everywhere else. And, and I really do thank you taking the time to participate in this. Uh, I mean, I took tons of notes. Um, I mean, it's everything from every part of the system is responsible for the well-being of the athlete. We're serving. Um, you know, you cannot be what you cannot see that Dr. De Stennett said. Um, Dr. Hassler, mentorship is a relationship that goes both ways. Um, you know, Dr. White, again, saying, don't let something bother you five minutes if it's not going to impact you um, five years later. Um, Dr. Johnson, the, the SMART um, uh, acronym for goal setting, just so much um, rich knowledge um, that Dr. M um, Burton and I will put together um, and send out um, to you guys, and we'll definitely try and connect um, interested attendees um, with some of our panelists, um, because I think we've really planted some seeds here um, for some meaningful connections and relationships that can be built uh, upon just this session today. Um, so um, I'll, I'll let and um, pass it over to Dr. Monique um, Burton if she wants to um, say any parting words. Yeah, I just, again, would echo everything that Bianca said, Dr. Edison said, and just super grateful for our panelists for taking the time on a Saturday. Um, and also just so grateful for all of you attending this and taking your time to learn from all of our experiences and truly hope that it's helped to give you some advice, maybe some inspiration and know that we are here cheering for you. We are here and happy to be mentors for you. And so we really look forward to having the opportunity to connect and you know, maybe working alongside you. Well, I don't, maybe I'll be retired by them, but <laughs> maybe working alongside you someday as well and watching all of your successes. So thank you again so much. And we will make sure to get this information out to all of you as well. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Peace and blessings. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.